Step two, we need to identify our performance obligation. I'm going to make use of our lecture notes to explain this step. Therefore, please refer to your lecture notes. If you prefer, remember, include your principles on this page. A performance obligation is a promise in a contract with a customer to transfer to the customer either one good or service that is distinct. Now, this is important, guys, or a series of distinct good or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. Now, when you refer to our page, you will remember step two, we need to identify our performance obligation. Therefore, we need to identify what is a performance obligation. We have indicated that we know that this is a promise. And this promise, guys, can either be one, a legal obligation, and in terms of IFRS 15, we will call this explicit, or two, this can be a constructive obligation. Now, what is a constructive obligation? This is an action by the entity that creates an expectation to the customer. I'm going to write this down for you guys. This is an action by the entity that creates an expectation to our customer. And we will look at this in detail when we talk about IS37. And in terms of IFRS 15, this is an implicit performance obligation. Remember that this is a promise and that this promise is to deliver either one distinct good or service or two, a series of distinct goods or services. Emphasis on distinct. Now guys, do you think that admin fees shall be included in this performance obligation? Let's talk about admin fees. Our entity had to incur admin fees to set up the contracts. Our customer will have to incur admin fees such as bank fees, opening a new account and so forth. Who will be responsible for these fees? The customer or the entity. Therefore, important that you know that admin fees and setup fees will not be included in your performance obligation. I'm going to refer back to my lecture notes and we will look at the definition of distinct goods or services. Now, I'm going to explain this by means of this diagram. There is two important questions that you need to ask yourself. The first question is, is the goods or services capable of being distinct? Therefore, can the customer benefit from the good or service on its own or together with other readily available resources? Now, guys, what does this actually mean? If you purchase a cell phone, yeah, you should be able to use that cell phone. But what about a vehicle? Now, let's say, for example, we purchase a new vehicle. But they indicate to us that they are not going to provide us with the wheels. Will this be a distinct product or goods or service? No. Why not? Our customer will not be able to use the vehicle without the wheels. Remember guys, if you think about distinct, think about our vehicle. This is actually pretty funny guys, because will you really now buy a vehicle without wheels? Our second question, and it is important that you identify, there is and. Therefore, both of these should be met. Distinct within the context of the contract. Now emphasis on the contract. Is the entity's promise to transfer the good or service separately identifiable from other promises in the contract? Now guys, we use this identifiable word pretty often now. Now what does this mean? If you refer to the paragraph on the previous page, it indicates to us that the entity does not provide 
a significant service or integrating the goods services with other goods services promised in the contract. Therefore, guys, there is no other integration with other products. Two, the goods or service does not significantly modify or customize another good or service. Three, the goods or service is not highly interrelated or highly dependent. For guys, you see that this relates to other, other, other. Therefore, this good or service should be able to stand alone. The entity does not have to provide A plus B plus C and so forth to be one product. Now, if we ask our first question, capable of being distinct, and the answer is yes. Extremely important, you need to ask the next one. Distinct within the context of the contract, if this is yes, this is a distinct performance obligation and we need to apply RFRS 15. If the answer is no, this is not distinct and we combine this with our other goods or services. Okay. Satisfaction of performance obligations. Now you can include that this relates to our step 5. Now the question why did I include this then with step 2? When you look at step two, we had to identify our performance obligations. Therefore, if you think about this, the next question, when will this be satisfied? Therefore, I have included this within step two. However, this is part of step five as well. Our question, when will the entity satisfy the performance obligation? When they transfer the promised distinct goods or services to the customer. The customer has to obtain control of that asset. Now, how do we distinguish if there is control? We need to identify who will receive the future economic benefits from that asset. If our customer will receive the future economic benefits, then we know that our customer has control. When will this happen? This can either be over time or at a point in time. Now, when you think about our basic class example, at a point in time will be the handset. Over time will be an ongoing process. You will always identify first if it is over time. If not, you know that it will be at a point in time. Satisfying the performance obligation over time. Remember, over time, continuously. Now, the standard indicates to us that this can be identified if one of the following criteria are met. The customer simultaneously receives and consumes the benefits provided by the entity. If you think about our class example, this will be the customer that receives the monthly data, calling minutes, and so forth. And as the customer receives it, the customer will use it. And the following month, this will happen again. The month thereafter, this will happen again. Number two, the entity's performance creates or enhances an asset. Now, when I think about this one, the entity's performance, if I have a contract, for example, with Vodacom, the entity has to keep on performing, ensuring that the internet towers are working. Now, guys, we're not going to go into a discussion about this one here, that we have internet available everywhere. The internet towers has to work. Therefore, our entity has to keep on performing for our customer to be able to use the data or minutes. And then number three, the entity's performance does not create an asset with an alternative use and the entity has an enforceable right to payment for performance completed to date. Okay guys, therefore our customer has to pay debit orders for this specific asset. Our customer will not be able to use an alternative asset with the same services. Therefore, main thing guys, this is an ongoing process. You will always ask yourself the question, is this over time? 
If the answer is no, you know that this will be at a point in time. Now, at a point in time. Emphasis on the fact that control should be transferred. At the point where control is transferred, our performance obligation will be satisfied. Now, it is extremely important, guys, that you please read through the information that they provide you with in an example, and you can read through the indicators included in RFRS 15, paragraph 38. I want to talk about customer that has the legal title to an asset. Now, this we can debate, guys, if this means transfer of control. A customer can have a legal title, but this does not always mean that they control the asset. And therefore, you will have to think about the future economic benefits of the asset, and you need to apply your professional judgment in theory questions. Now, if you want to, guys, refer to your revision page. This is an our step five. We have indicated that the performance obligation can either be satisfied over time or two at a point in time. You can add this to your picture. Performance obligation can either be one at point in time or two over time. Let's refer back to our notes. Measuring progress. Now guys, the progress of our satisfaction of our performance obligation will be used on our revenue recognition. Therefore, based on the progress of our satisfaction of our performance obligation, can we recognize our revenue? The main thing, the entity's performance in transferring the control. And then a single method should be used for measuring progress towards complete satisfaction should be applied to each performance obligation. Now guys, this will be for example, if we have a timeline and there is an ongoing over time performance obligation, we need to be able to measure this at a certain point when we need to recognize our revenue. For example, if our year end is in the middle of our contract, we need to be able to recognize the revenue up to that date. Therefore, RFRS 15 provides us with methods on how to measure the progress. And when we look at our input or output method, this may be used whichever is most appropriate. Now, do you know the difference between an input and output method? Let's quickly talk about this. If we have, for example, a construction industry, uh, we need to determine what is the construction costs on a certain project. And we use our input method. We will determine what is our total of our construction costs over the total costs of our project. And this will be based on our input method. Therefore, we will calculate this based on the input. Second, output. If we have agreed to complete six townhouses for a customer, but we have only completed four out of the six, our output calculation will then be to calculate four out of six of the costs. Now, if there is any changes to the entity's measure of progress over time. This will be seen as a change in accounting estimate and you will have to apply IS8. 